everyone, welcome back. Um, I'm here to introduce David Ferguson, the head of digital innovation at the Media Energy R&D UK Center. Um, if you recall, this is a rescheduled talk. David was originally supposed to speak this afternoon, but has graciously bumped up in the schedule to accommodate. So uh, in his spot for later on in the afternoon, there will be a panel session. I encourage you to attend as well. So uh, David runs the uh, digital innovation team at EEF Energy. And they basically get to play with all sorts of cool new technology and kind of see where the emerging trends are going. Um, in addition to working with artificial intelligence, they work with virtual reality, augmented reality, blockchain, and a host of other really exciting things. But I will let David tell you. Thank you very that. much. Thanks, Jess. And the reason uh, Jess knows all about what we do is because Jess is one of the current uh, members of the one Planet MBA here at X University, and she's been working with my team over the last few months on a piece of work all around AI and what it means for our business and where we should take it. So thank you very much, Jess, for all of your help over the last few months. Uh, so as Jess said, I'm, I'm David. I uh, head up our digital innovation team in R&D. Uh, I live here in Exeter. I work in Brighton and in London and in Paris. So I spend a lot of time on the train. So if you know the 652 up to Paddington, I do too. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about AI in energy. I'm going to dwell a bit on the energy side and not too much on the technical AI side. So uh, one of the reasons I love working in digital innovation is, uh, apart from the fact that it's really good fun, is that we like to dwell on all these profound statements of tech leaders and assume that what works for Facebook would work for our own organizations. And this is a classic example. Uh, and also the second picture of Mark Zuckerberg of the day, which is <laughs> slightly scary. Uh, but anyway, move fast and break things. Unless you're breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough, which is uh, wonderful. This is the environment that I work in. So this is the reactor building for a nuclear power station. Underneath the floor is the actual nuclear reactor. And that enormous green thing that you can see above it is uh, the machine that is used to extract 25 meter long fuel rods full of uranium pellets and replace them with new ones. So this is not the place to move fast and break things. It's the kind of environment that's dominated by engineers who work out exactly how things are going to work with, with cold precision. It is, however, a place that's ripe for innovation. What we're not talking about, I should point out, based on the last presentation, is a uh, autonomous, self-driving, uh, internet-connected nuclear power station. We've heard why that would be an extremely bad idea. But there are lots of ways that digital innovation could massively improve the way that we operate our business. But what we have is, because we work in this environment, we have a culture that is very risk-averse. Most of our workforce were trained in the 80s. They're getting towards the end of their careers. And, and the idea of innovating is not something that we do. We are admittedly risk averse. To make matters worse, the whole energy system is going through a bit of a transformation at the moment. The old system was quite straightforward. We had power stations that sent electricity to the, uh, the grid and the distribution network, and then to us at the end. It's linear, and it's relatively straightforward. The new system is far more complex. So we have renewables on this side, on the upstream side, which produce electricity when the wind blows or the sun shines. Um, we have uh, battery storage that's appearing on the uh, upstream side as well to help cover some of that gap. The same transmission and distribution. And on the customer side, we're seeing massive change. We're seeing the emergence of uh, electric vehicles that are taking electricity from the grid and potentially will discharge to the grid, adding complexity. We have uh, internet-connected devices that can, can be controlled remotely, including smart thermostats. Uh, we have PV, again, that creates electricity when it's sunny. Uh, and we're beginning to see, again, battery storage on the, uh, on the customer side. So all of this is incredibly complex and difficult to manage. And there's a huge role for modern technology, including AI, to play a big role here. Just to illustrate the complexity, on the left, we can see uh, this is for early August this year, generation output from solar and wind. Uh, and there was a, when is that? That was a Friday the 4th of August when wind was generating about 9 gigawatts of electricity and the sun uh, PV was generating around 6. So that's 15 gigawatts of power that's being produced by renewable sources. Uh, at the moment, the country is using about 35 
gigawatts. So it's about half that's being produced by renewables. That night, it's down to three gigawatts because the wind had stopped and the sun had gone away. So you've got this enormous variability. So 12 gigawatts of power that went off during that time, which is extremely difficult to manage. And that's exacerbated by the fact that we now have a million homes with solar panels and a million homes with smart meters. So you're seeing a massive change in the way that the energy system works. And referring back to my earlier point about it not being in our culture really to innovate, the main innovation is not coming from the energy sector itself, it's coming from outside. And so we're seeing some really interesting uh, innovations coming from, from startups and from established players that are moving into our sector. So we heard about blockchain earlier. There's a lot of interesting applications of blockchain in the energy sector. So there's an interesting company called Electron that's looking at how we can use blockchain to enable customers to trade electricity with, with each other, cutting out the supplier and cutting out the distribution network. Got uh, DeepMind, Google DeepMind, who are looking to use their uh, AI capabilities to help optimize the, the transmission grid. And we all know about Tesla that is single-handedly reinventing the automobile industry and potentially also the, the solar industry. So these are moving into our sector with new technology, but also with new ways of working that are deeply unfamiliar to, to us as an organization. So very challenging environment. Uh, and in that context, uh, EDF Energy, the company I work for, set up a, a research and development team about six years ago with the aim of beginning to plug that technology debt that exists across our sector. And we now account for about half of all private sector investment in R&D, uh, in energy in the UK. And we divide it into five teams. You can see there they kind of do what they say, including my own team, which is digital innovation. And we have uh, data scientists, developers, uh, digital designers, and innovation experts. And we work with all parts of our business to understand how digital innovation in its broadest sense can can help the organization. And the number one topic for us at the moment is artificial intelligence. Uh, it's important when we're talking about AI not to get carried away. Um, Jamie made a very good point earlier that at the moment we don't see a systematic deployment of AI in industries. We see a number of specific interesting use cases and that's what I'm going to talk about today. However, AI will transform many industries, as Andrew Ng, one of the leading thinkers on AI, said recently, but it's not magic. We have this view that AI is going to be like a, uh, an incredibly intelligent human that can do everything everywhere. That's not yet the case. We've looked at where artificial intelligence could apply to EDF energy, and uh, it's kind of fair to say it can be applied everywhere. So we've looked at what AI can do. So it can do reasoning, it can do knowledge, it can do planning, it can do learning, natural language understanding and perception. And all of these can contribute to different interesting use cases across our, our industry. Uh, so in generation, we can do things, understand we can do things like condition monitoring and predictive maintenance. For the grids, we can predict, again, predictive maintenance, demand-side response and optimizing trading. For customers, it's about customer service, it's about home automation. And then there are lots of support functions that can benefit from this as well, such as supply chain and legal. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a few of the early things we've done in these areas, some proof of concepts around digital replicas, customer service and energy use analytics, and then talk about the two big things that we think are particularly interesting. So these are all early R&D uh, pieces of work that we've, we've developed. The first is uh, adding AI to digital replicas. In France, we've begun the process of creating a digital uh, twin of our nuclear power stations. That is going in and taking high-definition panoramic images, laser scans, in order to create a, a digital copy of the power station so that we can begin to prepare to do engineering works in advance. In that, uh, in each power station, there are about 30,000 components with labels that we wanted to link through to a central repository of all the manuals and, and descriptions. And we wanted to be able to do that in the digital twin. We recognized that we could do that manually, um, but it's going to take about four person months per building to do that. And we have about 56 buildings to do, so it's going to be a huge amount of time. So we developed a, a deep learning algorithm that would identify these uh, component labels on the plant. And we trained it 
with a, a, an open data set uh, and managed to do this in about a fortnight actually managed to run the whole uh, analytics piece to identify um, the 30,000 labels uh, among the half a trillion pixels of high definition photos uh, and we managed to pull out and identify all, all those labels with our 105% accuracy that is we found labels that no one actually knew about on pieces of component that no one actually knew about but an incredibly effective uh, and very time efficient way of doing it and obviously once you've built that tool you can then redeploy it for all of your other facilities so that is actually now being rolled out across all of our plants in France using a similar technology uh, this is optical character recognition it, it, in the pre smart meter world it was very difficult for us to get accurate meter readings from our customers so we launched an initiative uh, a few years ago where we asked customers to take photos of their meter reading and send it to us. And the way that we processed that was we sent those to uh, a support centre in India and someone would look at the photo and type out the number and update the account, so not particularly high tech. Uh, we also found that only about a quarter of all those photos were actually of meter readings. The rest were of uh, water meter readings or your central circuit board or of body parts which was great. <laughs> uh, a surprising number of body parts to be received. Uh, but it did give us a, a huge data set that we could then use to train to work out how we can do this automatically. Uh, we did this about three years ago and we came up with about 79% accuracy and we're now doing it again using some more uh, modern deep learning techniques and we're getting it up to about 99.99% accuracy. We've also begun to experiment with, well, what can we do with other data sets that we're collecting as an organisation? And uh, like many companies, we sell a smart thermostat, uh, which we were just, um, the, the data was really going nowhere. So we started collecting the data to try to understand, well, how do customers actually use this? How do they heat their home? What are their, their patterns? And we use some uh, machine learning techniques to begin to cluster customers into different usage patterns which was really interesting because this was literally the first time we had been able to cluster customers based on their actual behaviour rather than, than on crude demographics, which had always been the mainstay. So for the first time we could, we could group people and we could also identify people who had particularly inefficient <laughs> ways of using their, their heating controls, so people who set their set pointers 28 degrees for 24 hours a day for the entire year. It also, interestingly, allowed us to see when people are on holiday uh, so we know when ha houses are, uh, are vacant, which is particularly interesting um, for security and privacy reasons, obviously. And it also allowed us to begin to understand and to test whether we could predict when boilers are going to stop, stop working correctly, because we can see telltale signs of, of, of inefficiency. So this is really interesting. For the first time, it was a, a, an old energy company begin to experiment with the power of, of data and what we can do for our customers creating additional services uh, using the data. And the last thing we've really looked at is how um, natural language understanding can support customer service. We did quite a lot of work with chatbots to start with. Uh, I'm interested actually, who's used a chatbot? Who used that chatbot and thought it was good? Yeah, so this is kind of our conclusion, is that chatbots are very interesting and there's been a lot of work done with chatbots. So a chatbot is, is kind of like text messaging, but with a robot. Uh, the robot will understand what you're saying and can offer advice. Our conclusion so far has been that they're quite bad, that the customer experience is quite bad, and that there are very few use cases where they work really, really well. Nevertheless, we are pushing ahead and trying to develop uh, much more sophisticated chatbots that can offer genuine assistance for our customers. We also worked uh, very closely with Amazon for the launch of the Echo device uh, last year in the UK and we were one of the launch partners and we had some Alexa skills that allowed customers to do some very basic things with their account. But what was interesting there was um, understanding actually in what ways can voice be useful, in what ways is, is, is voice a, a good way for customers to interact. Uh, and so asking Alexa how much energy you used over the last month or so is actually not very good because you'll get a figure that is basically meaningless. Um, there are times when it is particularly good if you just want to submit some basic information or get some information back. So chatbots and voice 
a, a mixed experience for us, but we consider them still interesting to explore. So that's uh, a few examples of things that we've done so far. Um, I want to talk about our vision and two areas where we see AI being particularly interesting uh, for the energy industry. And we've got two. So real-time con condition monitoring for, for power stations and the intelligent home. So power stations are fantastically complex systems. Um, they comprise tens of thousands of individual components and circuits uh, and were designed generally in the pre-digital age. Understanding how those systems operate is extremely complex. Uh, and we see an enormous potential for uh, AI to begin to help make sense of what's going on. And, that, and that's in two ways. The first is predictive maintenance, so being able to identify the performance of components in the plant and predict when they're going to go wrong based on past performance. For a, power st a nuclear power station, we tend to turn them off every 18 months or so uh, for about 30 days, and, and that costs about a million pounds a day. So we want to jam all of our work into that period so that we make the best use of that uh, amount of time, and also so that we avoid um, accidental outages outside of that period. So predictive maintenance, predicting when things are going wrong, going wrong is, is extremely important. The second part is around how you offer support to people who are actually running the power stations, so condition monitoring. And we've done a few early experiments with some, some partners. And w one of the experiments, we looked at how different component parts, component systems of the, of the whole interacted. And we found that there were some very interesting connections between the system over here and an entirely unrelated system over here that affected their performance. And they are kind of cognitive tasks that are basically impossible for a human uh, to do because the systems are so disparate and complex. So we see uh, being able to improve the way that we run our power stations through these kind of four steps of explaining what's going on, predicting what's going to happen, prescribing actions, then, then automating things. As I said before, we're not looking to create a self-driving nuclear power station. Everything we do is incredibly highly regulated, and every change we make to the way that we run our power stations has to go through the, the regulator. So this is going to be slow, but interesting. The second area is the intelligent home. Around a quarter of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the UK come from energy use in the home. And that's come down a little bit over the last few years um, through uh, physical investment in, in insulation and LED lights. But all our efforts to change behavior uh, has basically failed. And the reason for that is that uh, energy efficiency is basically really boring and really complicated. And most customers cannot be bothered to do anything about it. So our vision of how we, we solve this is these three steps of first, show me. So show me what is going on in my home help me do something about it. So give me specific advice that's specific to me. So rather than saying the typical customer will save typically this amount if they do these kind of things, it's about you and your home. And then recognizing that still this is going to be very boring for most people, do it for me. So how do we automate these experiences? And, and the interesting thing here is we're moving from this idea of selling a product to selling a service because uh, doing it for me depends on what you actually want to do is comfort of interest to you, or is economy of interest to you, or is greenhouse gas, gas emissions important to you? And in that context, we need to understand not only uh, how much energy we're supplying and what you're doing, but actually what your experience is. So if, you, if we're going to provide you a, a comfort service, we need to understand, well, what is comfort to you? Because comfort for all of us is, is different. And we need to get some feedback on when you have achieved that level of comfort. Is it because you've stopped shivering, or is it because you're smiling, or is it because whatever? So we need to bring in not only energy data, but we need to bring in kind of uh, uh, physiological data and, and emotional data as well. And this is a fantastically difficult task. And this is where AI, again, uh, holds a lot of promise, because AI is very good at complex cognitive tasks, but it's also very good at thinking about systems. And again, your home with you in it is a system. So that's the intelligent home. Um, it is quite a long way off, but it's an area that we're beginning to explore with, with academic partners at the moment. Um, the final area uh, I wanted to talk about is uh, the challenges of turning vision into reality. So 
uh, we've seen that AI remains at the moment um, a kind of a proof of concept technology rather than being uh, massively deployed and there are some specific challenges for uh, legacy companies to really move in this area. And kind of talk about uh, generic challenges of AI and those that are specific to legacy organisations. So the generic ones are skills. There are not many people who genuinely know about AI and can use uh, and deploy those skills and they are very highly sought after. One of the reasons Google acquired uh, DeepMind was because they wanted to buy 400 highly qualified uh, developers and neuroscientists. So getting access to skills uh, is very difficult. Security, massively important. Uh, AI works very closely with the Internet of Things, uh, and thus security uh, is, is massively important, as we have already heard about. Ethics, fascinating area. If you are um, devolving decision-making to a, an artificial intelligence system, then you need to be very careful about what you use to guide the decision-making process, so introducing bias into that system, but also being able to explain how that decision was made. If I'm a medical company and my AI system says to you, no, you are not covered for this through your medical insurance, I need to be able to explain why rather than just having a black box provide the answer. Uh, and finally, privacy. Uh, we've seen that uh, through AI you can learn an enormous amount about customers and customer behaviour and we need a new approach inside our business to help people understand what is technically possible and what is morally possible. Then there's specific things for, for organisations like, uh, like mine. Data. We're at severe risk of having data monopolies. Uh, Facebook and Microsoft and, and, and everyone else have enormous uh, stores of data that they can use to train AI systems. Uh, companies like mine do not have those volumes of data at the moment. So getting access to those training sets is extremely difficult. Also, having the internal architecture to manage that data is particularly difficult. Connectivity. Um, I was talking to Adam in the break about uh, the security of our power stations and the fact that uh, most of the sensors inside our power stations are not connected to anything. We collect data by walking up to them with a piece of paper and a pencil and writing down what it says. Uh, for AI systems, that doesn't work particularly well. So getting connectivity to these um, sensors whilst not compromising their security is, is a big challenge. Um, rollout, taking this from a proof of concept to, to actually rolling out systematically is fantastically difficult. And the day job. I heard a great story about um, the demise of HMV and uh, there's a guy who's on the executive team of HMV just when the internet was arriving and, and HMV was about to disappear and he said, everyone says that we missed the internet. It's not true. We saw the internet coming and e-commerce coming but we were really busy we were really busy rolling out stores. We didn't have time to think about e-commerce and the internet. We were concentrating on kind of the old operating model. And the same goes for, for our business. People are too focused on the old ways of working to really think about the new tasks in hand. So that's a little canter through uh, AI in energy and some of the things that we're doing. Uh, in, in summary, the, the energy system is, is complex. It's incredibly complex and it's becoming more complex uh, as, we, as we develop particularly uh, renewables and electric vehicles. AI is not, man uh, and it's not man magic, but it will help manage the new complex energy system. Our approach and the approach of many organisations has been start small with very specific uh, difficult problems. And we've got a number of significant disadvantages and, and things that we need to solve if we really want to adopt this. That's it. That's me. Uh, happy to take any questions if we have any time. Thank you. Hey, I should also mention that David is a part an advisor on the all-party parliamentary group on AI. So his insights are not just guided in the energy sector, but uh, the larger UK governing body on AI. So very exciting stuff. Uh, questions for David? Yes. Um, you mentioned the day job. Um, the what? Sorry, the? The day job. Yeah. Um, do you, this is just a kind of curiosity. My wife is French, and actually, my mother in law worked for a year. Oh, okay. Um, so, do you find that the kind of the way that French do things um, affects the. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I worked. Yeah, so I worked in France for two years um, for EDF, and the, and I and I noticed. I'm quite perceptive. I noticed a few cultural differences uh, between the way that the um, the French work and, and the British work, and um, yeah, I, I think it goes for for all organisations really. But I think particularly in in France, there's a very um, siloed way of of working. Uh, I have my own office, which was crazy, really. The, to actually know what's going on across the business, you have to go and knock on someone's door and ask them, hey, what are you doing? And then go to the next door and knock on that door and ask them what's, what's going on. Uh, which, when you're, particularly when you're dealing in innovation, is, is crazy. You, know, you just cannot work like that. You have to work in a very collaborative way. So um, I, I think that's why the energy sector as a whole is absolutely ripe for being disrupted because it is not only the technology that's in a way outdated, but also our ways of working are massively outdated. So I think there's huge uh, opportunities here. Uh, and part of my job, an informal part of my job, is to begin to help people change in that way. So me um, moving fast and breaking things on behalf of the business is something that I try to share and get that mentality out. Okay. Um, I'm, we've, we've spoken before about yeah. innovation centres and, and, and innovation unions and whatever, but I'd be interested in, in how you decide, it's such a big space, how you decide with such a relatively small team which ideas are the ones that you will pursue. Because there's yeah. so much to choose from. And the other is, is EDF engaged in developing countries? So in, in markets where things are moving faster? Mm -hmm. Um, so on the first part of the question, it's, it's really hard and it's one of the things that keeps me awake at night. Are, are we looking at the right things? Have we missed something big? Uh, and I have a, um, a half yearly catch up with, with our exec and they ask me what's the next big thing and I generally say I have no idea. Uh, but it's, it's a really important question. What we generally do is we have a, a, a effectively a, a matrix which is uh, potential for our industry, so from kind of low to high, and the relative maturity of the organisation. So our job is to basically look at the things in the top left-hand corner, which is high potential and low maturity. So that includes things like virtual reality uh, and blockchain and AI. They're the three big things in the top left corner. That's not to say that they are um, immature technology. I mean, virtual reality has been around for, for years, but it's, it's very new to us with very high potential. So broadly, that's what we try to, to do, is focus in that top left-hand corner. And the top right, where it's high potential, but more mature, we do a sort of handover of, of competence to the business, so we assist them. So things like chatbots, everyone in digital now works in chatbots, but we've got particular expertise which we share. On the um, emerging markets, yeah, we, so EDF Group, which we're part of, has quite a lot of activities in, um, in North Africa. Uh, and uh, in beginning to work a bit in China as well, not much in, in India. Um, Brazil is quite an important market for us. But I think the most interesting area is in, is in Africa, where we've particularly been trying to build new business models around um, solar. Actually, how can you create um, a self-sustaining business model that supports people to buy and operate solar panels, particularly when they've got extremely low incomes? Um, and then bring those ideas back to kind of more developed markets. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating area. Thank you very much. Thank you.